Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, to welcome you all, and to uh, talk uh, about, to have the opportunity to talk, and more importantly, in my case, to listen uh, to some very sage voices on the US-Japan economic relationship. Uh, we are, we meet at a fascinating time. We are into the, uh, obviously, well into the fifth year of Abenomics, um, and we're just about to face, obviously, an election in Japan, too, so that looks like that will be an interesting test. Meantime, we're in the first year, I suppose, of what some people are already calling Trumponomics. Uh, that's a little less clearly um, delineated, shall we say, at the moment, because we haven't had much in the way of actual legislation. There's been some regulatory uh, action, obviously, but we're waiting to see exactly what the contours of beyond rhetoric and beyond some of the more um, dramatic things that President Trump has already said and done with regard to the global economy, pulling out of TPP, for example, being very critical, obviously, of global uh, free trade, uh, glo many global trade agreements, critical of NAFTA, critical of the, in many ways, of the entire economic uh, trading the entire international economic system that the world has uh, had for the last 30 or 40 years. President Trump represents as much of a breach with that as I think as Prime Minister Abe represented a breach with Japanese economic consensus when he became Prime Minister five years ago. So um, it is a really fascinating time. As I said, we've got an election coming up in Japan. We've got uh, lots and lots of um, interesting political developments here. And all of this, of course, now is to some extent overshadowed by the backdrop of uh, secure, the security question as regards Northeast Asia uh, with the continuing crisis, which I think we can call it, over North Korea's uh, ambitions and its uh, nuclear weapons program. And one of the things I'll be trying to learn from uh, Professor Hamada and from Dean Hubbard is how that, how the economic, not only how the economic relationship is going to unfold in the course of the next year or so, but also what ex to what extent economics takes a back seat to the security situation and the concerns that uh, everybody in the United States and Japan and obviously in Korea and China particularly have about uh, what's going on uh, in North Korea. So it should be a really lively discussion. I'm looking forward to it. There'll be plenty of time for question and answer at the end. As I say, we have, as you heard from Sakura, we have two extremely distinguished uh, experts uh, on this subject, uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing from them and from to giving you an opportunity to listen to them. But they need no introduction. Glenn Hubbard, as you know, of course, uh, Dean of the Columbia Business School, Distinguished economist, uh, was chairman of President Bush's, President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, uh, spent a lot of time in Japan, spent a lot of time uh, writing about and being um, a leading authority on economics generally, but obviously particularly international economics, uh, and we look forward to hearing from him. And of course, uh, to start off with, um, Professor Koichi Hamada, uh, you also know as a prime, uh, advisor to Prime Minister Abe, uh, professor of Economics at uh, Yale University. Um, uh, he's also extremely distinguished and uh, has great experience across the range of economics, both as an academic discipline and also as a, uh, as a policy question. Uh, and to begin with, uh, Professor Hamada uh, has actually uh, got some, uh, in the good tradition of excellent uh, professors, Professor Hamada has some slides, uh, and there will be a brief teaching moment from Professor Hamada, uh, which will get the conversation going, and then we'll have an interesting discussion about uh, the questions that Professor Hamada raises, but also some of these broader questions about the Japan-US uh, economic relationship. So if I may please, uh, Professor Hamada. Thank you, Mr. Baker, and thank you, Mr. Sakurai and Japan Foundation to invite me here. Uh, just to give s some familiarity to the present stage of Japanese economy or abenomics, I would like to show four slides. First, monetary expansion was tremendous. As many other countries, uh, the line shows the, I think, rate of monetary expansion. And it, it is now getting slower. The rate of expansion is slower, but money is still growing under the Kuroda administration. Next uh, slide. Uh, because of that, this first arrow, 
achieved rather remarkable results in unemployment rate. It started around 4.5. Mr. Abe came into the administration at the end of 2012, so the unemployment rate came down to 2.8 now, but still didn't trigger price increase or wage increase. That I'll come into later, uh, the reason why it doesn't. And uh, job offer vacancy ratio in, is increasing to one point in this four, five, and the upper graph with orange. And for regular workers that many people worry about, it came to just point to unity. So the labor market for regular worker is getting to be quite full. And the last, uh, next, uh, the last uh, slide which was made by my friend Tsukasa Jonen, most of the indicators, nominal GDP, corporate performance, and already I explained job market and fiscal condition improved. Uh, for example, amount of debt used and so forth is declining, but this is improvement, so he puts uh, upward looking arrow. In spite of uh, those things, uh, the nature of ma microeconomic mechanism in labor market makes wage price ratio still stagnant, but I will come back later. Oh. Thank you. It's going to go up. Ah. <laughs> Professor, if you want to take the, you want to take the middle seat, the middle seat. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Professor Mada. Very much emphasis on the first arrow of Abenomics, the yes. monetary arrow, and how uh, effective uh, you argue it's been. And I want to come to those a little more detail, come to that in a little more detail and maybe also discuss perhaps the rather less effective, maybe second and certainly third arrows. Um, but if I may start, um, Glenn, with you. Um, I mentioned in just in my opening remarks that you know, we're dealing with the era of Trumponomics, if we can call it that, whatever that is, and we're trying to make out what it actually all means. Um, you know, he has spoken in pretty hostile terms of traditional international free trade arrangements that we've seen, pulled the US immediately out of TPP, uh, very critical of NAFTA and some of these other arrangements. What's, what's, what, what have we learned so far in almost a year now of President Trump's administration about where uh, international economic policy uh, under President Trump, where it's headed? Well, it's a great question. I, I think we've learned from the beginning that one key thing that Donald Trump did is very similar to what uh, Mr. Abe did, which is to dramatically shift the psychology in a positive way of many business leaders and households. Like with Japan, that policy shift hasn't always been accompanied by uh, very specifics. We're seeing that here in the US, but it's been quite material and quite important. On international economics, I'm disappointed, but not for the reason you might think. So the standard economist critique of Mr. Trump is his obsession with bilateral trade deficits. That's clearly nonsense as a matter of, of economics. The nation's uh, overall uh, trade position will be just the mirror of its financial account position. We know that. It has to do with saving and investment. 
But the real source of my disappointment is that the president isn't tackling the policies that would help the people affected by trade. So in other words, uh, policies about a radical rethink of our labor market institutions and low wage work, that would speak to his constituency. It would be a radical break and would enable the support for trade that's needed. That's my disappointment that he didn't get Econ 101 right, well, that, that's not really such a big deal. Uh, Professor Amato, you, you've been advising uh, Prime Minister Abe. Um, President Trump, when we, uh, candidate Trump, was very critical, uh, exactly as Glenn said, of um, Japan and other countries because of their trade, uh, their approaches towards trade, and as, as Glenn said, that seemed to be essentially uh, exactly um, proportional to the size of the trade deficit the US had, very critical of China, very critical with Mexico, of Mexico, and critical of Japan. Um, he's been, long been a critic of Japan's uh, domestic policies insofar as they relate to trade. Then when he came in, I'd say the first, almost the first thing he did was withdrew the US from participation in TPP and talked about a new economic relationship with Japan and you know, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, who's been very critical of Japan, has been... Um, uh, very much, uh, I think, involved in formulating policy with regard to Japan. From Prime Minister Abe's perspective, from the perspective of the Japanese government, how, how, how are they handling this and what do they expect? How do they expect this economic relationship to work? Are they, gonna, are they expecting to, make, to have to make major concessions in order to avoid real tension with Japan, with, with the United States? I think from textbooks type of international trade, uh, what uh, American negotiators or policy makers talk about the international trade is uh, a little bit uh, off the point or in many ways irrational. Uh, however, there is always uh, that in ja Japanese oriental thinking, there is tatemai and honne, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, official statement mm -hmm. and uh, implied intentions. And uh, Mr. Sakurai, president of Japan Society, kindly introduced me to Mr. Ross, uh, former chairman in Washington, and of course, we couldn't solve the difficulty for 30 minutes talk, but uh, still, uh, he has a very reasoned, seasoned view about Japan-US or China-US relationship. That is a uh, hope. And uh, Wilder uh, was uh, Mr. Lighthizer, uh, who I met through my dormitory mate at HGS of Yale University about 50 or 60 years ago, was about the same way, but uh, they were always relatively considering the options towards China and Japan. So if uh, Mr. Abe or Seko are uh, uh, reasonable enough, uh, I think there may be some way out of uh, this uh, difficulty in trade issues. But I agree, trade issues is one of the difficult aspects of relationship. Glenn, you and I are both old enough and you've been involved in many of these discussions over the year, but I'm, over the years I'm old enough to remember Pretty well every single U.S. president for the last 30 years has had issues with Japan uh, on the economic uh, front. I can remember the first President Bush going there in 19, 1991, I think it was, and uh, especially seeking uh, to open up Japanese markets, particularly in, in, in autos, but in other sectors too. Long-standing criticism of not only of, of the, of the non-tariff barriers as, uh, as, as outsiders certainly see them to trade, uh, you know, reg heavy, heavy domestic regulation, and of course, um, you know some of the some of the, some of the practices that Japan has used in the past. Do you think it's and, and by the way, you know we've gone through many of these discussions and the, if you if you measure it simply by the de deficit, which I totally agree is a is a rather crude way of measuring it. Deficit is still what, sixty odd billion dollars, significant amount of uh, Japanese uh, GDP. 
Is there any reason to expect, under Wilbur Ross and President Trump, the, that will, there will be more success, if you can call it success, in getting Japan to open up its market somewhat more than, than it, uh, to, to, to play fair, as the president would put it, uh, which it claims, well, claims it's not doing now? I think if there's success, it's less about whether the president can get the government of Japan to play fair as to whether the government of Japan sees it in its own self-interest to do that. Uh, you spoke about the third arrow, and you know Japanese multinational companies remain the envy of the world. They are wonderfully productive, successful enterprises. Having said that, the, the inside Japan business sector is much less competitive by global standards. The prime minister has spoken eloquently to that. Opening that up to more foreign competition is in Japan's interest, not just... Uh, America's interest. So I think if there's a chance for that to win, it's really from that realization more than whether uh, Secretary Ross or President Trump uh, has uh, has an impact. And on that, I'm, I'm actually optimistic. Because you think whether whether it's things like more labor force participation, particularly you know some of these big structural reforms that uh, Prime Minister Abe is trying to do, you think that they're making progress and that that will address some of these issues that the U.S. has? I think it will certainly address some of the issues. There, there has been progress in labor force participation, uh, particularly among women. Uh, there are more initiatives in some service sectors and financial sectors for openness. But yes, there's a long way to go uh, in Japan. I think one of the strengths of the president is his willingness to call out some of these practices because, in fact, they are unfair. And I think for him to say that is perfectly okay. What isn't okay in my humble opinion, would be you know, punishing the U.S. itself by withdrawing from TPP or other arrangements. Professor Amada, you uh, very, uh, gave us a very clear um, illustration there of, uh, of, of, let's say, the first era of Abenomics, and which you uh, say has been a terrific success in terms of uh, growth and uh, uh, Japanese growth and unemployment, and even to some extent, although perhaps not as much, uh, inflation um, as some people would like. Um, the second, and as Glenn says, the the implementation, if you like, of the second, but especially the third arrow, yes. um, the, the the regulatory, the structural reforms, so far has proceeded obviously more slowly uh, by its very nature. You would expect it to, but uh, this, I think, as Glenn says, Glenn argues, this will address some of the issues that the U.S. has. You know, as he says, it will be in Japan's interest too. Give us a sense of where you think Japan is in that process, and you know, perhaps after this election, assuming Mr. Abe is re-elected. What, can, what more can we expect in terms of structural changes to the Japanese economy? First, just a short remark about the second arrow. Uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, consumption tax hike was a contractionary effect, and it continued more than we expected. But Did you think that was a mistake, by the way? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, many people in Abenomics mm. think that was a mistake, mm. but uh, always growing up, the growing size of government may involve other inefficiencies. So uh, once we, uh, we achieved, Japan achieved uh, the peak figures you saw right now, the numbers you saw. I think it's, uh, in spite of this uh, contractual me measure, monetary policy did so much well, that uh, probably would be blessing. But uh, another aspect of structural policy, it, it's not just the economic mechanism, but reform needs political agreement or some uh, the political process must allow that. Uh, for example, the gun violence in this country is a problem of big uh, structural problems, but it's very difficult uh, for politicians to solve. So th there are many political or government officials uh, vested interest and so forth. Uh, those elements prevent Japanese uh, progress in structural reform. But so far it's uh, doing well. The productivity of the last half years or so 
is quoted at 3.5% labor productivity increased. I, I still don't believe flatly because next collection of statistics may let it down. However, the total during total productivity increase or average productivity increase was 0.8% only until the middle of last year and in the past it accelerated. So that means by saving redundant labor and so forth, Japanese uh, firms are making progress in productivity increases as well. Turning to um, back again, actually, to, to the monetary policy uh, picture, Glenn, um, the, obviously one thing that we're experiencing in the US right now and can expect to experience even more, perhaps in the next couple of years, is the beginning of the unwinding of the tremendous monetary stimulus. Uh, Professor Hamada, you illustrated the size of the BOJ balance sheet. I mean, I think relative to GDP, yeah. it's even larger than the Fed's balance sheet. But the Fed's balance sheet was for what, four trillion, four trillion right. dollars still, Glenn. They've announced now that they will you know, be, really begin that process of unwinding, although it will be gradual and slow. Where is that? How, how, how do you expect that to unfold? Um, you know, how quickly? How quickly will we get any kind of normalization? And, and take us through the global economic implications of that, because obviously through the currency and through other effects, uh, there could be some quite significant ramifications for the Japan relationship, but for the rest of the world. Glenn, are you first? Well, it's, it's a very important question. I, I think the first goal for the Fed is to define what size balance sheet do you need to conduct monetary policy. It's likely larger than the status quo ante balance sheet before the crisis, but it's certainly much south of $4 trillion. And so articulating that number then tells you where True North is. Then you can define a path to get there. The Fed's been a little more ad hoc than that, but I think the clearer it is, the easier it is for markets to absorb. And certainly right now, I think it'd be quite easy to normalize gradually without a large effect. I think on rates, as opposed to the balance sheet, the Fed is likely to remain more of a wait and see. Some rate hikes, but I think more of a wait and see. I'm not as puzzled by inflation as the Fed seems to be. I think inflation will be at the 2% level uh, within a year. So I, I think uh, Chair Yellen is right to have the patience that she has had to stay, to stay the course. But I think the balance sheet will be where the discussion is. And I think the Fed needs to adopt what I would call a maintain and explain strategy. Of tell, tell us where you're going, that's maintain, and then explain it whenever you deviate. Why are you not puzzled by the inflation picture? I mean, we, again, I know this is a very old-fashioned Phillips curve approach, but we do see unemployment down towards four, about 4%, uh, well below what people used to think of as any kind of natural or non-accelerating inflation rate. And yet, as you say, inflation is still very subdued. What, what, what's, well, what's, the, what's the explanation? I, I think that, well, the clear explanation would be that there have been a series of one-off global supply shocks. And the question, of course, for the Fed is, uh, is that story right, or has there been a structural break? I still think it's the one-off supply shocks. I think that's the Fed leadership's view, and I think it's correct. I mean, we will see, but you certainly see wage pressures building, not at dangerous levels, certainly, but getting back toward consistent with the Fed's 2% goal. So I guess I'm, I'm a little bit less worried there. Professor Hamada, what about the BOJ? Um, uh, how, how, do, how do you see that? What's the, uh, what's the course of normalization of Japanese monetary policy? There is a folk song uh, this road I have seen a long time before. <laughs> <laughs> In Japanese, Kono Michi wa Itsuka Kitamichi. And uh, if you want to return to that stage in usual economics, uh, that is not so much to be worried about. You have to do carefully. However, recent behavior economics tells you don't do the same way when you are going in one direction. And if you get reverse way, then people may behave different. So we have to be, be cautious. But 
I don't think for the security market professionals, it is a matter of life or their survival. So it's important. But for the national economy, I don't think it is such a big deal. Uh, about the Philips curve and so forth, I think we are in great period of AI revolution and uh, many I wanted to translate Japanese article into English article and vice versa and it was very costly but when <coughs> I, my friend recommended me to try Google I said uh, they don't make any translation useful for professional use. But if I tried, it did uh, work uh, equivalent to um, medium research assistant uh, can do. <laughs> so that's one job that's, uh, one, one job that's gone already, is it? Yes, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, uh, it serves probably my research fund, 10K, $10,000 may be saved by making one book in both in Japan, Japanese and English. And there are so many things. Uh, I had a hobby of composition, music composition, and my friend celebrated my 80th birthday to have a CD of my composition, long time made. But I didn't bring any music notes and so forth. All of them was scanned in my computer printer and sent them and then CD was made. So uh, during an Uber, probably Uber needs some labor, but make some part of driving labor uh, unnecessary. So it is uh, in the time of uh, AI revolution. And uh, because of that, Jap Japanese, in spite of very good uh, record in the Japanese economy. People in regular jobs uh, competing with uh, scholastic record and uh, protected by some kind of union, Th those large firm laborers are not feeling happy. And I think th this is the exact reason reason uh, Mr. Trump could uh, be elected. So I, I think Philips Cup uh, and so forth, uh, inflationary target, inflation target is a secondary target to achieve, uh, to enrich our life, like employment, production, consumption, and not by itself important. My whatever in it, my uh, cycle, uh, my wallet will lose whenever we have 2% inflation. So uh, other things equal, uh, non-achievement of inflation target is a good thing for the economy. <laughs> Only thing is to have 2% inflation going on, people will spend more, right. naturally. So the, it is a useful way to achieve the production employment goal. But right, uh, and, and low prices, or, you know, or falling prices individually can look very attractive to individuals, as you yes. say, with wallets, but obviously to an economy as a whole, the deflation that Japan experienced yes. was a classic, was classically damaging to the economy. Yes. And that does seem to be passed now. I'm, I'm, and Japan is yes. you know, experiencing so some, some I, modest inflation. But I wanted to ask you, what is, Governor Kuroda doesn't seem to be in any hurry, really, to 
significantly change tack. No, unlike the Fed, well, the Fed's not in any hurry either, but the Fed has clearly announced that it's unwinding and it's clearly moving in that direction. It's already raised interest rates. <coughs> Do you think, the, how, how long can this go on with Governor Kuroda maintaining that balance sheet as it is, maintaining rates essentially at zero? Is that, are we just going to have to wait until inflation does finally finally hit that 2% uh, target, or are we going to see movement by the BOJ before that? Right now, male of Japanese labor force is almost completely occupied or employed, 70%. So women's participation rate is still increasing. And old age, like people like me, is participating more. So this, these slacks are keeping uh, inflation from coming into. And uh, I don't know how long it will take. 2.8 unemployment was considered to be according to Philip's carb analysis, mm. And, mm. but it, it was not. So we have to continue the same way. Uh, Glenn, when the Fed, there have been several instances in the last few years when the markets have uh, responded to Fed signals of normalization, you know, taper tantrum we had a few years ago. Um, it happened again uh, when, when, you know, when the Fed started raising rates, threatened to start raising rates about a year ago. Um, how do you see the markets react? You, you said you think that it could be relatively, or, relatively orderly. I mean, it has been very disorderly when markets have reacted like that with significant effects on emerging markets, in particular, you know, the dollar rising very strongly and all the impact that that had, obviously helpful for the Japanese economy, but, um, but not helpful for, for, for other economies, perhaps. How do you see that as the Fed does normalize, uh, and especially if the BOJ isn't going to move at all, how do you see that affecting international economic and financial arrangements? Well, I think you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. One, what do you think quantitative easing's effect on the term premium was? The largest effects are the Fed's own studies that suggest it could be about 100 basis points. I doubt that very seriously. I, the numbers more like half of that are mm -hmm. consistent with the academic evidence, and which means if you were to unwind that, ask yourself well, what would be the effect of 50 basis points on business people's decisions in the real economy, I suspect not the end of the world, if that were telegraphed and choreographed well. What hurt the Fed before, and I think could very well help it this time around, is fiscal support. It would be much easier for the Fed to do its job if at the same time the government were providing more fiscal support. I think the tax reform, were it to pass, would be the kind of shot in the arm that gives the Fed <coughs> room to move uh, without adverse consequences. Do you think we're going to get that tax reform? I mean, it's um, I do. process has started. You do. I and do. Just give us a sense of what the outlines will be. Obviously, won't necessarily look exactly like the proposal from the GOP last week. But what what what's the what are the broad outlines well, of it? Well, if if you start out with what do we really need? We desperately need corporate tax reform that would lower the corporate marginal rate to below international standards, which mm -hmm. would bring money back into the United States, capital flows toward the United States. All of that's a good thing. Uh, we obviously need simplification and cleanup on the individual side, but in terms of the real punch from tax reform, it's going to be on corporate. That's also an area where I think Democrats and Republicans could agree. You know, the burden of the corporate tax is borne in large part by workers because of diminished investment and productivity, and I think that's a selling point to many Democratic members of Congress, too. So I think corporate tax reform could happen. I think it would be very, very popular were it to happen, because it would really push economic growth up and help the Fed's job. Politically, of course, uh, there's a budget box. So to go to a 20% U.S. corporate rate costs about, give or take, $1.5 trillion. Uh, that's real money, even in Washington. And the budget resolution does provide for a $1.5 trillion tax cut, but it's not clear there's the votes mm. for that. So that, to me, is the real issue. Can this team negotiate what should be politically doable? There I have questions. But is this worth the candle and would it have a big effect? Absolutely. Professor Hamada, the, the second arrow of the fiscal situation in Japan has been a cause of concern to a lot of people for some time. It, uh, some, you know, huge debt to GDP ratio, what is it, over 200% of, uh, 
of, of, of GDP. Uh, everybody's been arguing that this is unsustainable. Or, you know, a famous quote economist who says, you know, things that things that can't go on forever generally don't. Um, obviously, that was part of the reason why the government did uh, in, increase the consumption tax. Concerns about the, the fiscal position. How much concern should there be about Japan's uh, huge fiscal uh, deficit and the huge debt that the government is carrying? First of all, the Ministry of Finance succeeded in propagating wrong information to, to the world. If you count the net deficit, the Japanese government has a large asset, including foreign assets. So it is not that astronomically bad. But still, uh, net debt, I don't know. If you count the real estate uh, government has, it uh, can be comparable to other government. But uh, net debt is still of a substantial amount. And uh, I am, uh, in part, uh, a subscriber of uh, recent FPPL, Fiscal Theory of Price Level, uh, Professor Sims and so forth, uh, advocating. Uh, government has every yeah, the government has new taxpayers, so borrowing too much or so sometimes borrowing and ro rotate it uh, can be done by the government. It is not a very serious matter as some of the Republican politicians think. However, it, it's another question whether it's a wise way or not wise way. If you borrow too much for the country like the United States, uh, it will increase its dependence on foreign countries. That's uh, true, borrowing from foreign countries. Yes. Well, although in Japan's case, there's heavy... That's still yes, very Japan domestic, has... Uh, that savings, part so. is uh, OK. Yeah. So uh, for me, the best scenario is this abenomics prosperity will continue into 2019, and it, it, it will become quite natural to increase the consumption tax rate at that time to make the Japanese government budget more healthy. Or in that case, I still propose to, be, to do it by 1%. One, by one this is wrong proposed ideas by Feldstein and so forth mm. to increase it gradually. Mm. And 3% was really mm. big because usually that Habergas triangle lost by tax is related not to the tax proportional to the rate, sometimes the square of the rate matters. So, Glenn, do you, do you broadly agree that the the key thing, in Japan, as far as Japan is concerned, is to get growth going and get some inflation going and, and, and not to worry too much about that fiscal position. The fiscal position will be taken care of by accelerating growth. Do you think that's broadly the right approach? Well, I don't think the fiscal position will be entirely taken care of by growth, but I do think the prime minister and his advisors, Professor Hamada among them, are absolutely right. The job one is to get the rate of growth up. For Japan particularly, because in the US, of course, we have a growth challenge, but in Japan, because of a shrinking labor force, there's such pressure on productivity growth and structural reform. So I think that is exactly the right answer. It's the right answer here in the United States, too. It's just we have more favorable demographics. I want to turn it over to the audience uh, for questions uh, in a minute, so please uh, prepare your questions. I just want one last topic I want to discuss with both of you, which uh, I mentioned in, in my introduction. All of this important conversation about the economic relationship and about the domestic economies of the two countries is right now overshadowed and in danger of being completely eclipsed, one could say, by the security questions. I'm wondering what um, that, the threat, frankly, the, the, let's be clear about it, the threat from North Korea, what that does to 
all of to these questions of the U.S. Japan economic relationship. Does 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 the U.S. swallow its concerns about the trade deficit? Swallow its concerns about need for more deregulation in the Japanese economy? Is that so overwhelming that it just pushes? That it just pushes? Is this threat so overwhelming that it pushes these other issues completely off to the back burner and we deal with them some other time? What what what, what do you think, Professor Hamada? Uh, Difficult question to answer directly, but I think about the security question as for well. uh, my research was concerned political economy or monetary uh, relation or so <laughs> so what I am familiar is some kind of game theoretic or some kind of strategy theoretic uh, analysis of uh, s safety and conflict. The, I think only well-established fact in this type of analytical political science is that you shouldn't be frightened by the threat of other parties. Tit for tat strategy, it is called, that you, you start with embracing attitude first. That is very important. But as long, the, when the other party behaves strongly against you, you have to defend firmly or even counter make counter proposals to attack the others. And in that sense, Mr. Trump is, in some sense, to say hard things is, would help. So that's why Mr. Nixon, Mr. Reagan could achieve the world peace. Uh, however, this is a textbook case. If Mr. Trump has a hard line too much, then American probably wouldn't get hard at first, not so much. But Japan, Japanese audience, or particularly Korean or Okinawa-based people, those are hit uh, directly. So the brinkmanship has to be done very carefully. And uh, I just started reading about Kennedy's uh, missile crisis case, uh, how that could be an example, but it's very difficult. That's uh, the difficulty. Glenn, it used to be thought that the economic tensions that we see from time to time between Japan and the US could undermine or damage the crucial security relationship those two countries have. It's almost as though that's been flipped around this time, and it's that the, the, the security relationship is now so important that the economic issues will just you know, either be unresolved or will have to be resolved at some future date. What, well, I, I understand that's an argument, but the reason I don't think it's quite true is both countries have an interest in having strong and stable economies. Mm. You, you cannot project hard power in the world if you don't have a lot of money. That's the root of it. High productivity growth economies are the ones that can afford defense. So I think at the, at the root, the economy remains important. The challenge for Japan, the challenge for the United States, is how to engage China in both an economic and security discussion. China, I'm sure, does not want large US military presence uh, in North Asia. China also does not want the economic dislocations. That's really the discussion uh, to have that might threaten the stability of the North Korean regime. But it's a first order problem for the world. Right. Um, we have uh, some time for questions, uh, observations. Please, there are microphones. Um, uh, there's a microphone over there. Right at the back, the gentleman has his hand up. If you could um, just identify yourself and fire away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Burke, and I work with the Schiller Institute of Helga Zepp LaRouche. Recently, Prime Minister Abe has made um, somewhat of a change in his policy towards the Belt and Road Initiative of China. And it looks like there might be a change in terms of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. 
President Trump also had a positive meeting with State Councilor Yang of China back in June about U.S. corporations being involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. So I'm wondering if Trump's visit to Asia coming up in a month could lead to some kind of a win-win-win relationship around global infrastructure projects that all three nations could build and benefit from. I don't know the exact answer to the question, but uh, one thing I can tell you is uh, Mr. Abe has a very strong political instinct. Or what. His uh, grandfather uh, was Mr. Kishi, and uh, he chose uh, exact moment that he think the election would win for his party. And uh, Mr. Abe is rather reserved in saying many things to us rather than listen to us. So I don't know exactly what he is thinking, but he will take uh, any change in policy that would, he would think benefit Japan. So he, he has uh, the, both sides, uh, hard negotiator and also uh, cooperating negotiator. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that uh, there is the potential for a win in infrastructure around the world. Uh, there are huge infrastructure needs. Most of those needs uh, do not need to be met by the public sector. There's a huge amount of capital in the world. Most of the uh, things that hold back infrastructure around the world have to do with local regulations and public policy. But I think a coordinated attack on infrastructure is a good thing. It's also a way for America to reestablish its soft power position in the world. Make no mistake about it, Chinese infrastructure investment in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, is only increasing Chinese influence. That could well be us. So I, I think there is a chance for exactly that. Whether it's accomplished on the president's trip, I, I don't know. Good. More uh, questions, please. There's a lady uh, over there. What are some of the please, please, most... Please, could you just please oh, tell us, I'm please sorry. Tell us who you My are. My name sorry. is Asami Ishimaru. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the investment management business. Um, what are some of the most egregious Japanese trade practices that you would like to see changed? I'm talking to uh, Professor Hubbard <laughs> yeah, in particular. Although yeah. <laughs> well, maybe Professor Hamada will have a few yeah. too. But uh, <laughs> go on, Glenn, I think maybe... Well, I think the, the issue is really um, mainly about market access. Uh, particularly in services, which has improved but remains uh, inadequate. Uh, it is, the U.S. is a relatively open market to Japanese competitors, uh, certainly in manufactured goods and, and generally in services. That is simply not true uh, in Japan. Uh, it's not to Japan's interest. The loser of that is less a U.S. citizen or U.S. company as a Japanese person who pays too much for some particular good or service. So I think that's really the issue for Japan. America is not going to win this war by preaching to Japan. The war will be won when Japan realizes it's in its own interest to open its markets. I heard in the mega bank that top rooms of the bank's building facing the Imperial Palace was occupied by the CEO, past CEO, and many president and CEOs of the past. And they go to the same lunch with the present CEO. So, <coughs> and 
uh, bank person scolded me very much. That was not true, but an another source of rumor told me that they changed that custom later. So maybe my pointing out may have worked. So elderly generation has have has strong or substantial control about the present customs. Those uh, aged generation who suffered from deflation ages uh, really are afraid of investing in stocks. But can, can I, do you accept Professor Harbour's point that there are yeah. sectors of the Japanese economy where market access is still not as it should be for a properly open trading economy. Do you accept, do you, accept, do you, do you think that reform is needed? I don't frame that word, but uh, Dale Jorgensen of Harvard University has a productivity chart where Japanese sectors are weak in productivity and they say agriculture, that, that's understandable. Mm and uh, energy and uh, bank, uh, finance. Those very where Ministry of Agriculture, Minist and particularly Ministry of METI and the Ministry of Finance are strong. So the regulation are very strong in those sectors. And uh, my bright students at Tokyo University went to those regulated sectors mm -hmm. very much. So I think government interventions, at least in the past, di did not uh, work very wisely. Uh, at least I can okay. not to uh, you. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Um, yes, lady at the front here in the white. My name is Miki Kashiwagi. Uh, I manage investment. This question is for Professor Hamada. Um, I understand U.S. Trump administration left TPP, but Japan is continue to negotiate TPP. How uh, do you evaluate the current situation of TPP? Mr. Amari worked very hard, and uh, it's. Uh, pity that the U.S. left, uh, because uh, many of us thought the U.S. is uh, essential. But uh, from game, game theoretical point of view, if we c create good uh, FTA with other countries, then the U.S. may think that uh, they lost big fish, so they might come back. That's the best scenario, but otherwise, uh, I think uh, whatever beneficial to the rest of the uh, rest of the group, except U.S., is to seek the their best effort to create a better union. So it's uh, U.S. Uh, absence may not be the real negative point. But the point is, even if the U.S. doesn't come back, Japan plans to, you know, continue yes. to, to to continue with the pro, with the TPP process and ultimately to sign. I, I, yes, yeah. Glenn, do you have any thoughts on is, any oh. prospect the U.S. coming? Uh, yes, some some more questions. Yes, lady there in the, the pink uh, top behind. Me. Hi, um, my name is Jacqueline Meziani from S&P Global Ratings. Um, what role, if any, does immigration reform play in addressing the labor shortage? Theirs or ours? Yeah. Actually. Uh, yes, yeah. Let's, let's start with Japan. <laughs> okay. Let's start with Japan and then Glenn can okay. answer about uh, yours. I, I think <clears throat> I, I am a beneficiary even though I retain Japanese citizenship yet, uh, I'm a great 
beneficiary of American immigration policies. Uh, Me too. <laughs> when I had difficulty in substance of scholarship, uh, I, I had hardship, but I was never told that uh, Hamada, you are doing that not well because you are Japanese or whatever. So that's a great uh, society and great dynamism that keeps this uh, country. But for Jap Japan, it's very close society and we are, they are accustomed to be the in homogeneous world. So Mr. Sakai, a former <coughs> economics minister, told me <coughs> Uh, I was worrying about the military attack by North Korea and other things. But if North Korea uh, became disturbed, then there will be exodus of people from that country to all over the world. And Japanese people are not at all accustomed. Mm or to a kind of situation. So immigration problem is uh, important and we must use the American way of classifying different kind of immigrants and so forth. But still the problem is enormous. Hey, Glenn, the US doesn't have the kind of long-term labor supply problems that on the scale of Japan's. Uh, but it does have an immigration system that by any measure is kind of broken and... We, we do, and it actually is important for the nation. It has been an important part of our, of who we are as a country, but also mm -hmm. why our demographics have been more favorable than much of the rest of the industrial world. To me, the difference between the U.S. and Japan is that in, in Japan, immigration attitudes are really a cultural, it's a deep-seated thing. It's not about economics, particularly. Mm -hmm. The U.S., it's really about economics. So the, the changes in the 1965 era, immigration, uh, combined with the collapse of what was known when I was young, the Bracero program, led to big shifts in both legal and, and illegal immigration in the country. And what politicians call immigration is really two problems. One is high-skilled immigrants uh, to the United States. There's really... Uh, absolutely no reason the country shouldn't support that in a full-throated way. There's no way that more, let's say, Indian engineers in the country is going to kill the wages of American-born engineers. That's just silly. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there is a real chance that the wages of low-skilled native-born people are held mm -hmm. down by low-skilled foreign-born people. When you say that, you're not culturally biased or racist. It has to do with the laws of supply and demand, nothing mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. So the country really has a choice uh, about maybe defining categories of immigration or helping native-born people left behind. That's really the issue in the U.S. I think it really is a fundamental economic issue. I think it had a lot to do in the past presidential election, and American politics has to solve it one way or the other. Thank you. Um, another question here. Yes, here at the front. Hi, I'm Kathleen Hayes, Bloomberg Television and Radio. Uh, I attended a a talk last night at Columbia at the Center for Japanese Economic Policy. I think I've got it just about right. Um, and business. And business, there you go. <laughs> um, and his talk, uh, Professor Amada, was about demographics and what they mean for Japanese economy and policy. Um, and of course it has huge implications for the pension system and the deficit and so many issues that are not that far down the road for Japan. But I guess my question is more about um, Abe and the declining birth rate and the decline of the Japanese population. I'm, I mean, is there anything that you would advise him to do to try to change this around? So should the government incentivize families, you know, through tax credits or, you know, getting childcare for something to help stop this steep decline in the population that is going to mean so much to the country on so many levels. At least after I saw many examples of artificial intelligence, they are 
many robots and other things are doing in place of dark, in place of peop actual people. So I don't know whether population growth itself is the only necessary thing. Uh, we will have to... I agree that the more social or educational measures, or particularly the women's employment system would help uh, child bearing process and so forth. But in spite of that, we sh probably uh, we should take population decline as kind of uh, given factors and to live uh, with it uh, because uh, many things that people are doing were uh, is being are being replaced by machines and so forth. So we will have a higher standard of living by using more machines and so forth. That's uh, my ideal sort of a little provocative answer. We have time for one more question, if anybody has one final um, <coughs> pressing question. The gentleman there in the red stripy tie. <coughs> Uh, hi, thank you. I'm Cesar Rojas from City. Uh, I would like to ask about um, what's your sense uh, of the risk of the renuclearization of Japan following the rising or an escalation of the geopolitical risk with North Korea? Did you hear the, the what's the danger? The renuclearization of Japan? The, um, um, oh, I see. That's, uh, I hope. <coughs> the pacifist Japan constitution, whoever right, wrote it, uh, helped a lot the great prosperity in Asian or Japanese area. So I don't think, it's, so I, hope this uh, present situation will continue, whatever the military situation is. And, uh, but Japanese constitutional scholars and so forth are so inflamed in mm. to classic uh, pacifism and uh, they put first the written constitutional statement beyond uh, over the objective of safety and prosperity. So that is the problem. And probably Mr. Abe is trying to provoke that kind of safety issues. Mr. Abe is the right person he would like to say to protect the safety of the present and future generation. So about the decolonization, my answer is negative, but that's a limited answer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are unusual and fascinating times. Uh, there is so much going on um, everywhere, but particularly in this, uh, these important questions of US and Japan. We've got a Japanese election in a couple of weeks, APEC meeting uh, shortly after that. So much happening. I think we could not have had a better uh, couple of professors to guide us through these, uh, these momentous events than Professor Hubbard and Professor Amada. So please join me in thanking them very much for their... <laughs> <laughs>